Hello. Hi, Barbara. Good afternoon. Hello. Good morning. <laughs> nice to see you on uh, my podcast. Thank you for having me, Sunil. Yes. So those that are listening and uh, now trying to figure out uh, who is this personality on the other side, uh, uh, let me start off with an introduction that uh, jumps off the LinkedIn bandwagon, but more in terms of uh, uh, who I know Barbara as. Um, Barbara and I met through uh, Working Out Loud, uh, and we did a special program to help people uh, that have been affected by uh, you know, the Ukraine uh, and Russia uh, crisis. So that's when I met uh, Barbara. And uh, after that, I've been a fan. Uh, I've been wanting to have her on my podcast for a very long time. On multiple uh, aspects of uh, life, I think there, there are some similarities and some uh, experiences of hers that really made me uh, inspired. And I wanted to share her journey, her story with more of my audience and essentially with more audience across the, the world. So Barbara was born in the United States and then uh, currently resides in Switzerland. And uh, she is an HR consultant. Um, and before that, she's traveled all across the world, uh, five countries, in fact, and finally made home uh, in the uh, Switzerland uh, Alps, very near the Alps, if I get it right. and. Uh, yeah, so uh, always a person with bubbling energy, always a good person to talk with. Um, and she has uh, had some adventures in India as well, which also caught my attention. Uh, she's one of the few uh, which I consider lucky and uh, I'll also uh, ask her opinion around it, her experience around it. She's met uh, Mother Teresa uh, in India and I was like fascinated by that. And that I think was a single... Uh, strong reason apart from other reasons to also get you onto this podcast uh check in with you as to how that happened what's the story all about um, and i think the other reason uh, we also uh, have a very strong connection is that uh, we both are passionate around well-being at the office uh, which she's going to explain in a little more detail what's burnout how how it can be integrated in the organization culture and all that and yeah, I think we've also some uh, interesting views on HR, uh, employee experience, engagement, her own experiences. And now she is self-employed, works um, uh, with on, on her own company, her own uh, two feet and yeah, jumps in different uh, puddles. And, uh, you know, she's also a volunteer, also at times has worked, continues to work, I think, with the UN, if I'm uh, not mistaken. So yeah, I think uh, this and much, much more. I I'd like to stop the introduction and get to the personality. Uh, so, Barbara, welcome to the uh, podcast. It's very nice to have you here. Thanks, Sunil. It's nice to be here. Did I miss anything? <laughs> no, you did a good job. Bravo. <laughs> Thank you so much. So, where do, where would you like this uh, experience share to start? So, I I've given my viewers an indication that you're from the US now in Switzerland. So that's that's a lot of uh, traveling to get to some place. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's always good to start at the beginning. So just, uh, yeah, I grew up in the US and in, in New York State to be specific. Um, and I spent all of my young life there, including my university years. But um, after I finished university, uh, I caught the travel bug. And so I left right after graduation and I moved to the UK. So I lived in the UK for about seven months. And then I moved to Ireland. I lived there for about four months. Uh, and then I traveled some more about around Europe and I ended up in Greece uh, where I mm -hmm. also lived for about three months. Um, so already very early on in my um, adult life, I was uh, traveling around the world and, and meeting people from different cultures and experiencing working in different um, organizations in different countries. So it really opened up my eyes at a very young age. Mm -hmm. So Ireland, England, Greece, and you know, you also said you've also been to India and now uh, you're in Switzerland, which, which is that place that uh, calls out to you the most? Well, uh, 
in telling you about that initial travel experience, um, I haven't yet talked about other travels that I've done. So after the European uh, experience, I went back to the US and worked, started my HR career, um, specifically with Hilton Hotels. Um, and I worked there in New York City and then in Florida. And I still had the travel bug, so I moved to Australia and I lived in Australia for a year. Um, and then in going back to the US after my year in Australia, I traveled for four months throughout um, Southeast Asia and India, Nepal. And so that was my first time traveling in India. Um, so to answer your question, uh, because I needed to tell you where else I went, um, really the country that um, is closest to my heart is Australia. Um, so uh, I spent a year there and I just loved it. Uh, I, there were so many aspects of that country that resonated with me personally. Um, and I did try to move back there uh, some years after, but it just didn't work out. Um, life had other things in store for me. So I did end up in Switzerland where I've now lived for 21 years. But um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I've had a, a nice exposure to a lot of different countries, that's for sure. I, I, I uh, observed that, uh, you know, in Australia, you were awarded a one year working holiday visa. Mm -hmm. And you were on a, uh, you know, a bare boat charter company and an art, arts organization, a flower nursery. And uh, you were also with uh, some, uh, you know, Telecom Australia. Yeah. Yeah. So I had a, a really great kind of vagabond existence when I was there. I was 26 years old. And so I was really open to a lot of different things. And I just worked um, to make money and to support myself and to to have a, a life experience, so to meet a lot of different people. But I was fortunate because I had already started my career in HR that um, uh, I was able to get a temp job with Telecom Australia in the recruitment department. So it was related to my career uh, back in the US that I had started and that was very helpful for me. So it was something I could put on my CV, that was for sure. Mm -hmm. So what has uh, been your most interesting travel experience? Oh, that's a hard question. Um, I mean, I've had so many, really. Uh, you know, I some really fun things, some scary things. Uh, you know, when you're traveling, especially I did a lot of traveling on my own. Um, so as a solo traveler and as a woman, too, you have to be always on your guard, uh, I would say, but also open um, to meeting new people. You know, you have to kind of suss people out pretty quickly and figure out if they're uh, good potential traveling companions or not. But I met a lot of great people. Um, you know, I always uh, fell into nice relationships with people where we traveled together for a period of time. And, and I really love that. And that um, travel experience actually helped me a lot with my HR career because as an HR professional, you know, you have to be pretty outgoing and social and, you know, not afraid to go up to people. And, and also, um, have the sensitivity to to help people feel comfortable very quickly in a new situation. So those travel experiences definitely helped with my professional life. Um, so I can't say that I have one um, specific travel story that stands out over everything else. But I know from talking to you in preparation for this podcast that you're super interested about my experience meeting Mother Teresa. So I will tell you about that. It was definitely in the top five of my travel experiences, but um, I can't say it was number one. I, I have so many, but um, um, how that came about is that I was traveling around India in the, in the mid to late nineties. And um, uh, I was just going around the country. And as I mentioned, I was meeting people to go around different places. I mean, one thing I did before meeting her was um, I actually did a 10 day silent meditation retreat. And that was fascinating because anyone who knows me knows that I like to talk and, and I'm quite social. So to be silent for 10 days in a row was a challenge, but it was really an excellent experience. So that's something that stands out. And, um, as I was traveling around the country, um, you know, at that time, there was a strong backpackers network and, you know, we would all share with each other different experiences. So I was fully aware that there was an opportunity to go to Calcutta and to go to um, the establishment that Mother Teresa was running and um, to volunteer for a short period. You could stay there for free, but you had to volunteer and help out. 
And so I did that. That was part of my mission. You know, when I was traveling, it was one of the things I really wanted to do. And so I just had the fortune when I was there that she was around. She wasn't always there, but she was there. And um, she came up to me and she said, oh, uh, where are you from? And I said, uh, I'm from New York. And, you know, honestly, I can't remember now what her comeback was. She did say something to me about New York because she had been there. Uh, but I just, um, you know, she took my hands in her hands. So it was really a, a, a wonderful connection to have that moment with her. And, um, you know, I cherish that. And that's, once again, the wonders of travel is that you can uh, find yourself in, in special situations very unexpectedly. And, and so I was really fortunate to, to have that and to have met her. Mm. Very interesting. And then when, when you were sharing that, I, I had a big smile, uh, you know, on my face. And I was just imagining that encounter uh, with, with somebody who's, I think, been, been the epitome of compassion and uh, many other things. So you said you your mission was to volunteer, your mission was to, you know, meet new people and have new experiences. Mm -hmm. So what uh, put you on that path? You said you've got the travel bug, but then... Uh, Travel bug plus something? That's a good question. Um, I think it's just probably part of my nature. You know, I um, grew up uh, at a very stable childhood. I mean, I we didn't move around. I stayed in the same home all my childhood. Um, I'm the youngest of seven kids. Um, and I, for whatever reason, you know, I felt already when I was a teenager still in school that I had sort of itchy feet. And what I mean by that is I just had the desire to see new things and meet new people. And I'm very fortunate that my parents were very supportive and that, you know, we didn't have a lot of money as a family because there were so many kids, but they didn't, they never held me back and said, oh, you, you shouldn't go there or you shouldn't do that. And especially when I became an adult, I mean, I always worked throughout my teenage years and, and then started my career. So I always had my own, you know, financial uh, backing, you know, I was able to support myself and, um, you know, they didn't ever intervene, my parents and say, no, you shouldn't go there or can't do that because they knew I had my own money and I could do what I want, wanted with it. So, you know, it's just my nature, you know, I really like, um, to, to go out there and meet new people. I, I would say I get bored quickly. I like, or I, I, I like variety, you know, I'll have to leave it at that, that uh, I'm not only with, um, you know, my personal life and my travels, but also professionally, uh, I like variety. And that's one reason why I've liked HR as a profession, because it's a professional field that really is varied and changing all the time. And um, it's not um, repetitive, it's not boring. So uh, it's a field that has suited me really throughout my career. Mm -hmm. So you said uh, you were uh, one among seven. Well, the first thing that came to me was, uh, you know, home alone. Uh, there are so many people at home, and, uh, you know, uh, the young kid gets gets uh, left back. So what are your, uh, what are some of your childhood uh, memories and impressions that that you still remember? Well, I mean, just being part of a large family was always nice, you know, I because I'm the youngest, uh, my eldest sister is 12 years older than me. And, um, you know, so she left home when I was still quite young, because she, you know, in the US, people usually leave home around 18 to go to college. Um, and so slowly but surely, my siblings left. And eventually, I was an only child at home with my parents. Um, but, uh, you know, the reunions, when people came back, when my siblings came back for the holidays or vacations or whatever, uh, was always quite fun. We had a lot of laughter in our family and we still do actually, we find humor in a lot of situations and, um, yeah, it's just nice to have, uh, you know, such a large group of people that are on my side, you know, to, to have that support and, you know, everybody is different as well. So you have um, probably again, maybe this is something that has helped my HR career is to be exposed to, you know, so many siblings with various uh, different personalities. So that has helped me adapt in the workplace. Yeah, so there's another pattern that I'm seeing. So every experience you're saying, hey, this helped my HR experience, this helped my HR experience. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so what? I'm only doing that, Sunil, because of the nature of this discussion. I probably <laughs> wouldn't do it if we were just talking over a coffee somewhere. But because you're, you know, delving into my past, I'm just uh, starting to see some connections with certain things. Yeah, so I, I can sense that passion towards HR, that uh, and that that motivation, that energy that comes when you are uh, on the HR path. But what put you initially to you know choose that and say okay, I am going to stick to it because you had you know like a lot of travel. There could be other experiences that you are encountering, but uh, HR seems to be the thing that stuck with you, and you stuck with HR. Mm -hmm. So when I was at university, uh, actually, <clears throat> I did my bachelor's degree in communication. So I, at that time, I was thinking to go into public relations or maybe advertising, so really public communication. Uh, but part of my curriculum, I had to take some organizational behavior classes. And um, the university where I went, they had a really good um, labor relations school. So it was very high level. And I was able to take some excellent classes. And um, especially the organizational behavior uh, classes were really interesting for me because um, I remember we had to do some case studies where we would be given um, a scenario that was happening in a workplace. And then we had to, uh, you know, kind of act it out in the class with other uh, classmates. And not only did I really enjoy that, but I also was quite good at it. It was something that came naturally for me. So it just... Um, Kind of incited me to pursue that and to study more in that area. And so when I left university, like I told you before, I went to um, Europe, I went overseas. Um, and, and so I didn't start my career right away. I did um, sort of odd jobs to support myself. But um, I always had in the back of my head that I wanted to get into HR because of the that exposure at university. Mm, interesting. So uh... What about HR uh, is challenging for you? Well, um, so Very I've been expensive. in HR for some years uh, and I, you know, once again, loved the variety. Um, to go back to your previous question, what kept me in it, it was just really, um, it's a great field because you can um, exercise your skills and competencies, but change environments. So I worked in a lot of different industries. Um, and for very large companies and some smaller, medium-sized companies. So I've liked that variety. There are some HR professionals that will pick an industry and they stay in that, but that wasn't, hasn't been my experience. Um, and um, I've done HR, you know, once again, in a lot of different organizations. But what I found um, over these last years, which is why I decided to go out on my own, is that um, a couple things, actually, it started to become a little bit routine for me. So uh, as I mentioned, I moved around and I worked in different types of organizations. Uh, but once you go through sort of the employee life cycle several years in a row, it's kind of repetitive. And especially if you're working in an organization that's not so open to changing certain things, um, then it gets a little bit limiting as an HR professional because you can project yourself into the future thinking I'm gonna be doing the same thing for the next 10 to 15 years. And that's not my cup of tea in case you haven't noticed that. Um, and so the other problem that I was confronted with in my last internal role is that's when I started to see the impact of um, uh, well-being in the workplace or the lack of well-being in the workplace. So um, honestly, in the first years of my HR career, especially in a very busy city like New York, I was never confronted with people who had burnout or any kind of um, uh, physical problems because of their work. And I started to see it more and more. And especially um, since around 2015, you know, I started to see cases of burnout and people on long extended sick leaves and all sorts of things. And I started to say, what's going on, you know, in the workplace? And um, Especially, uh, there's a couple things that I have in my head as to why that's happening, but we are in a 24-7 work culture now, you know, we're, we're tethered to our technology and people are, you know, constantly on call and um, especially in certain industries, I was in biotech and it's just ruthless because you're always against deadlines or you want to be first to market. And so it's really um, a lot of pressure and um, I felt like the workplace was eating up people and spitting them out. You know, it was just um, not healthy. And so I 
the combination of feeling a bit like things had gotten a bit routine, plus um, seeing these problems manifesting just made me want to, to try to go at it from a different angle. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think yeah, I also uh, very strongly believe that you know, the burnout is, is, uh, is a space for, for a lot of people to put their, you know, eyes on, put, put attention on. And like I said, people are uh, basically being consumed, spit out of the system. And then uh, after that, it's, it's a very long road ahead uh, mm -hmm. for, to even get back to normalcy, uh, feel good about themselves. Um, there's a lot of, even in terms of me as a coach, I have seen a lot of people who uh, come with that burnout space, uh, really unable to comprehend what what next, what what to process, uh, where to even start because there's so much uh, insight mm -hmm. that never gets uh, out. Mm -hmm. But even, like now, 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 in terms of you know companies, I think there's a there's a wave that's coming. There's change, uh, but I personally feel that uh, you know that the pace is not really uh, enough mm -hmm. to sustain what we have now started. What, what's already in place and to sustain it, I don't think it's enough. And it's always needed that uh, somebody in uh, like you in every part of uh, the world to take up on the you know wellness part. What's your definition in general of uh, you know, wellness? What's been your own experience with uh, burnouts, if, if there has been any? Um, well, I haven't personally had a burnout myself. Um, I saw it a lot uh, in my previous job. And I've also now through these last years met a lot of people who um, went through it. So I have an understanding of it from firsthand accounts from other people. Um, I would say, although I didn't experience it, I was on the verge. I, I would say at that job that I left because uh you know, maybe there was that uh, leading up to like not seeing the sense or the the purpose of what I was doing, you know, was but the volume was there. So I had a lot of demands. I was really um, spread quite thin. And uh, so I always, though, maintained a really good physical care. I was always making sure that I ate well, I slept well, I exercised and all that. And so I was able to have some balance. I was lucky I didn't get sucked into the hole, but, you know, for sure, if I had stayed longer, maybe I would have gone down that road. But, you know, in talking to so many people, I've done um, so, uh, a questionnaire with people who've experienced burnout. I've, I've spoken to a lot of people who, you know, have gone through it and uh, the their stories are very similar. There's some similar threads. And I think to your point, what you said before is true that, um, Unfortunately, once you go in that direction, it's really hard to come back in a healthy form and it takes time. And so it has an impact, you know, really long term or forever on your career. And that's why I think it's um, important to uh, be focused on burnout prevention. And for me, as an independent consultant, it's not only creating systemic uh, programs and support within organizations, but also I work as a career coach. So I'm, I'm focused on uh, working on the individual level. So empowering people um, to take over their work lives and to set some boundaries or develop uh, resilience and so on so that they can um, uh, do like I did consciously avoid the burnout, you know, so that they don't have a long-term impact. So um, often it comes up, you know, and I, I, I see this as an HR professional, like where employees feel like they can't say no, that they have to say yes to everything, that the, the deadlines are there and that they always have to show up. And, and I try to say that, no, you have the right to push back if it's unreasonable or if it's not sustainable, you have the right to, to push back. And I try to give them you know, support and ideas on how to do that without compromising their career, because everybody thinks that as soon as they say no or refuse something that they're going to be punished and penalized. And that's not the case. So I do try to see it from both sides. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that is true uh, in terms of uh, you know, the long term effects, physical, emotional, there's, you know, repercussions in terms of the family. Um, but you said, yeah, there's this, you can always say no. Uh, you can always uh, share your point of view and say, this is why it is. And I think punishment and, uh, you know, the after effects of saying no at times is is difficult. Again, it's a cultural aspect uh, in terms of 
maybe again it's in terms of upbringing the usual culture of the organization the culture of the country or the place that there exists there are a lot of such uh, aspects that you know uh, come in place and it's a very nuanced uh, topic mm-hmm. yeah so maybe what what works in uh, say uh, what works in india may not work in uh, so germany what works in germany may not work in switzerland and may not work uh, in in the us so it needs a uh, needs a both a, a deeper understanding as well as a power understanding mm-hmm. has to be done in a two pronged uh, approach and uh, yeah so when when you said uh, you work as a career coach so what exactly does a career coach do so i well you know what a coach does because you do coaching I'm but uh i spoke i focus specifically on careers so you know my background in hr i feel qualifies me to um you know help people through career transitions or changes or or whatever they're confronted with in a professional situation so i work um twofold once one i uh, actually see clients one on one um usually through word of mouth i get them i don't get a lot through advertising but um people will come to me and generally they're people that are either on the verge of leaving a job or have already left a job or have been unemployed for some time and um you know they need to get their act together as far as focusing on what they want for the next step of their career um uh, also i help with the technical side of their um cv um you know motivation letter or cover letter and and other things uh, miscellaneous documents um uh, you know we do a lot of different exercises uh you know just to dig deeper in terms of what um they they're looking for and so it's a a double support not only the support on the technical side of their candidate presentation but also sort of the holistic a- analytical you know looking deep and doing some introspection about what's good for them which uh, unfortunately a lot of people just don't do you know we get conditioned socially to go down a certain path and we don't often ask ourselves why we chose this path or uh, whether it's good or not good for us so that's the one on one work i do and i'm actually really excited right now because i'm involved in a program that's through the unemployment um office here in switzerland and it's a association of three or four organizations uh where we actually work with uh people who are on unemployment looking for work who are over 50 so there are older workers that uh are out of the workforce for various reasons and um this is a great program to give them extra support uh because obviously research and and statistics show that people over 50 have a harder time getting back into a job although they do and we have a very low unemployment rate in Switzerland it's only 2.2% um uh, but it takes them longer so i try to as a coach in this program i'm supporting people who are in that situation and using my background and expertise to try to move forward uh their situation in a positive direction. Mhm. I think this seems to be a thread in terms of uh, you know the employees after a certain timeline in terms of a certain age are not really uh you know in in demand or in vogue in in organizations and they're suddenly left with uh, oh no what what next what should i do. Mhm. i think that's a rising problem across different uh, places and and i think it's also going to hit india soon mm, probably and i think one thing i've found uh is unfortunately this population doesn't un- doesn't always understand or fully appreciate their value um so uh it's a little bit of a mindset and it, it comes across like where they are maybe not fully aware of all the things they've done or or realize how important the things they've done are and so they minimize their accomplishments and their and their work and um it comes across in their applications so then people on the other side of the desk like hr or hiring managers don't fully appreciate them as candidates but I think where I can add some value is to boost that level of value um not only through their CVs but also through how they think about their accomplishments and how that how they communicate that. I think it's a huge um uh help for this population, you know, and I'm happy to be involved in it. Yeah, so when you said um uh, uh 
Yeah, first of all, fantastic work. So you said uh, it also helps not just boosting their CV, but then how they uh, how they think about themselves. Uh, what are the stories that they're telling themselves? Ganna survey me and me and another uh, you know fellow coach in terms of what would be a good uh, theme for us to do a group coaching on. And one of the questions we asked is, um, what are some of the things that you're most proud of? And there were a few uh, who had you know shared in terms of the details. A lot of them said, oh, what's there to be proud about? Uh, I'm above my 45, 50 years. I don't think I've, I've done anything worth uh, being proud of. Mm-hmm. So those are stories we tell ourselves. Uh, we've not really uh, seen ourselves in a lens that's, uh, that's any way different from what the world sees us. Mm-hmm. And once we see the lens, uh, once we see ourselves down, I think the world also automatically puts us down. Yeah. And uh, everything changes. Then, Barbara, so how how young are you? Uh, I'm. Uh, <laughs> that's a. Where does that question come from? <laughs> there, there was a there was a connection between. So what I wanted to tell the audience is is that you know Barbara, who's uh, you know whose experience in life uh, has been uh, over many decades, and. Uh, you know, she's, she's moved out of a corporate space, uh, moved into something that you know, she's now doing it on her own. She helps others do it on her own. So the idea was to push uh, your story through such that, hey, you know, if Barbara can do it, so can you. Mm-hmm. And you don't, you don't have to answer the question. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think people can look at my background and figure out, but I don't feel like I need to offer up that you know, statistic. <laughs> so we have, uh, we have a... Um, I was saying we have a uh, not an idiom. It's it's there. You do, you don't uh, find out where the river is uh, river is originating. You don't ask somebody's age. You don't ask somebody's salary. So mm. a few more lists than that. But then uh, you you never ask uh, a woman how how old she is. Yeah, that's true. But I will just say that uh, regardless of my age, I feel very still quite young and energetic and. Um, you know, I think age is just a number. Absolutely. I think age is just a number. So I think I tell that also with people who are young. And age is just a number. And uh, yeah, you can uh, you can have a conversation around uh, with me that says, you know, I can be a five-year-old, a 30-year-old, and an 80-year-old in the same conversation. And so mm-hmm. age uh, technically is just, just a number. Mm-hmm. So you do career coaching, you've done HR, you're working as an now wellness coach. Uh, so I think I also understood that you work also as a mentor for women in uh, Switzerland. This is that something that I've uh, all right. So what what's been that experience? How did you get to that? So I'm involved with a program called Thrive with Mentoring. Uh, so it's a female focused program that was started by a woman, actually an Indian woman here in Switzerland. Um, uh, Shivangi, and um, it's now expanded to a global program. Um, and I've been a mentor in this program for two cycles, and now I'm a, a cohort lead with three other women for the cohort in Lausanne. Um, and it's really matching up professional women, um, both mentors and mentees, um, for a period of about six months. Um, and, you know, anything goes, you know, the men, it's a mentee driven program. So the mentee, uh, figures out what she wants to work on during that relationship. And then she uses the experience and wisdom and support of the mentor during those six months. So it's been, really been a wonderful experience for me. I've enjoyed it a lot. Um, And it, you know, calls upon a lot of my different skills and also my interest in meeting new people. So it's just been a, it's been a nice thing. And I started it during the pandemic. So the first year we did everything remotely um, and even that worked out nicely. So you can have mentoring relationships and never physically see people in person. Um, And one other thing I wanted to mention, um, you know, because these volunteer activities that I do are really important. I have several of them, but um, uh, I also professionally, I do a lot of training. So uh, I'm uh, usually contracted out to go into organizations and offer training. And at the moment, I'm doing mostly training in the area of communications, so presentation skills and also um, cross cultural communication. Um, and so I've really had the fortune to go into some really great organizations. 
uh, which is another wonderful experience for me as an independent consultant to be exposed to different organizations um, and be able to share certain skills and competencies, which are important kind of transversely across the business world. Um, and so that's a, a lot of fun for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mentoring is, is something that uh, does change the perspectives of both the mentor as well as the mentee. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, like I said, uh, mentoring, uh, you may not really need to physically meet the person. Mm -hmm. So I just, just wanted to say that we have not met in person, but but we've connected mm -hmm. <laughs> I think, very strongly. So mm -hmm. yeah. if the viewers listening in, I think Barbara was uh, uh, very strongly in instrumental in, in uh, now my experience uh, as you know, in, in, in a working out loud circle. Mm -hmm. You also helped in in terms of helping uh, you know getting me certain opportunities in terms of interviews getting putting me in touch with people so I, I also want to ask you so what what makes you give so easily hmm, that's a nice question it's a compliment and a question um you know I think uh it's uh partly my my personality my nature but it's also the um the fortune I have at this part of this time of my career where, you know, I decided now after many years of giving so much internally in companies that uh, as an independent consultant or a self-employed person that, um, you know, a big part of my mission is service um, through volunteer programs, um, but also helping people out because you know, I like doing that and I um, I like using my background to connect people or to help people support people with um, their career dilemmas, you know, that that's really my area of expertise and um, also break some myths that people have about the work world, about the job um, uh, search process or, you know, how they should communicate with companies or whatever. You know, I think that uh, we can simplify professional interactions and you break it down to really human connections. And um, often when we're younger, we're so intimidated by senior people or a certain corporation or whatever. But at the end of the day, we're all human beings and we all have similar needs. And so, you know, that's what I look at, you know, if I can help foster those relationships or, or broker some kind of situation for people to help them through um, then it's very gratifying for me. So that's that's kind of part of my mission at this time of my life. Mm -hmm. So you, uh, where and all have you volunteered? So what what's been that experience for you? Sorry, can you repeat the question? So where where and where and all have you uh, volunteered in your journey so far? Oh, okay, so um, well, you talked about working out loud. So I. Um, started working out loud around 2020 and I um, participated in two circles and around the, after the first uh, circle I did uh, I was looking to get more involved and so in Switzerland working out loud is quite prevalent in the Swiss German part uh, but it's not so well known in the Swiss French part which is where I live so with three other women um, Susanna Zimmerman and, and Nicole Hemmerich uh, we actually created meetups for the Swiss Ramond. And again, this was in COVID time. So we did our meetups always virtually. Um, and so we really tried to get people um, interested in working out loud to inform them about it and create circles, which we did successfully. Uh, and we finally, when we came out of COVID, we had a meetup where we did a, a in-person in gathering. Um, and we don't continue those efforts anymore. But um, I was able to continue on a bit with Working Out Loud through the Working Out Loud for Ukraine program where you and I met. Um, so that was also a volunteer activity. Um, I'm also active in my local village government. So I'm part of the, um, uh, the communal council here and I'm involved in a couple of committees for that. And um, currently one of my big things is actually um, in our local area, there's a very big um, uh, youth uh, soccer tournament coming up uh, with 5,000 kids expected over three days. And um, I'm co-responsible for the volunteers. So we're recruiting up to 300 volunteers to help out with this tournament. And so that's uh, pretty much the thing I'm focusing on a lot um, for these next couple of months. 
Mm, that's interesting. So that that is going to be enough. Uh, no, in, in, enough stories for another podcast, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting, but it's it's fun. I'm enjoying it, and um, and you know, all of these activities I choose, they're very complimentary, so it, it, it works out fine. Mm-hmm. So uh, a lot of lot of interesting things that you shared there. Uh, I had to ask, uh, what do you do to de-stress? Well, I'm physically active, so I do exercise every day in some form, uh, either walking, uh, yoga, swimming, or, you know, just some half hour of gym in front of the TV from in front of YouTube or whatever. Um, I like to read um, and I like to eat, <laughs> to go out to eat to restaurants. I mean, I like spending time with my family and friends. So uh pretty low key actually. And uh, one thing I do a lot is home, uh, home decoration projects. So I'm often painting rooms or redecorating things. So that's something on the creative side. Awesome. So uh, another question around uh, wellness and around well-being, because you, you have had experience there. So for people who are on the verge of burnout, uh, are undergoing burnout, so what do you feel, uh, you know, is, is something that they can safely do to uh, stay out of it or, you know, take baby steps uh, beyond that? So you're saying uh, that they've already gone into it or they're just on the verge of it? Both of us, both of yeah. them, for, for, for people on the verge and for people already in it. I think when you're on the verge and you realize it, I mean, unfortunately, some people get sucked into it without knowing what's happening and then it's too late. But if you are conscious that things aren't going well, it's so important to raise your hand for help. And that should be either through your employer, through somebody that you trust in the organization, your manager, HR, or somebody else, or uh, somebody in your circle, your family friend circle that you can talk to, um, to really uh, create awareness and connection with somebody else so that they can help you work through that. Um, Oftentimes people will go consult a medical professional who will give them some kind of medical support too. But uh, I think it's just important to connect with somebody when you're in that situation. And also uh, if, if you really feel that you still have the bandwidth to prevent it from happening, um, you know, really make sure you're taking care of, uh, of yourself uh, from a self-care point of view, physically, mentally, emotionally, you know, make sure you get enough sleep, exercise, good food and all of that. So I think it's really important. And I think often when you're in that spiral, um, often that's when you need to make a change as well. So you have to start taking matters into your hands. And if you realize that you're in a toxic work situation or um, a, a situation that's never going to get any better, that you have to really uh, take matters into your own hands if you can and try to make a change. I know that it's not easy always for people to do that, but if it's possible, you know, just say, this is not serving me this situation and I need to get out of it. Um, if you're already in that situation, I mean, this is where I see, especially here in, in the Swiss culture, that people do get medical help pretty quickly, which you know, enables them to get signed out from work for a period of time so they can recover and then just have the best kind of care, you know, through that uh, healing process, you know, to stay out of work as long as they can and to make sure that they're get, get, getting like either medical care or psychological care to help them through that um, or coaching or whatever. But, you know, make sure that you get into the right hands, you know, because there are some professionals out there that don't necessarily understand or support in the right way so it can be even more detrimental to go to somebody that doesn't know what they're doing than um, to be on your own Um, and you know just giving yourself time to heal and to come back as you have to I think that's important Mm -hmm. yeah I think uh, through that so people who uh, who are aware that they're getting into um, uh, you know a burnout phase or getting into that phase I think that awareness is is very uh, very much needed. At times, you get sucked in, and then you you're in it halfway through in that spiral, and that's when you realize, oh, uh, now things are different. Mm-hmm. I think uh, what what also shown through for me is that I think uh, raising a hand, pausing, 
asking for help uh, i think it will uh, it will it will definitely help mm-hmm. so i think for help seeking help i just want to add something that came to mind too is that this is where i like to do work as a hr consultant and that you know creating awareness in organizations and and specifically in hr teams about what they can do to support people because unfortunately when i've interviewed people that have gone through burnout they have told me that um, in some cases, more often than not, that their HR just turned a blind eye to them and didn't really get involved. And I think it's incumbent upon HR, if you have the bandwidth to support people to follow up and inquire after people, because that's really important to have a connection with the organization. So, you know, giving tips to HR on different ways that they can support people. Um, there's obviously a lot of confidentiality around this situation. It's a medical condition. And so you can't Pry, uh, probe and, and pry into people's personal lives, but you can inquire uh, benevolently about how people are doing and try to support them, you know, and show caring, which is, again, a sign of a healthy workplace. Mm. Yeah, true that. I think uh, a few things specifically in an Indian context, you also know that, uh, you know, I also shared my experience in, in, uh, in, in your uh, data collection for burnouts. So uh, HR having bandwidth and HR uh, also saying it's not our policy to really uh, work work on burnout. It's not defined in our policy, so we don't really care about it. Uh, I think a lot of things need to be changed because uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's very different like, when you when you're sharing about you know what happens in in Switzerland. I don't think we've uh, we've really gone to a place in India where we say. Uh, I can take a break from work and then I come back to you, come back another another point. The pressure is just too, too much. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, people pressure, societal pressure, company pressure. The pressure is just, just definitely too much. Uh, and I don't think people have enough pause and enough seconds to pause and say, okay, I'm undergoing burnout. All the things that they're saying is, hey, it's okay. You know, we'll, we'll, we've gotten through other burnouts. We'll get through this. Mm-hmm. I remember saying that, you know, I remember saying that to you or somebody else. I've been through so many that I mean, I will get through this one. And mm-hmm. then that's uh, unfortunately not the best way forward. There's a lot that, you know, organizations uh, can do in terms of policy, in terms of uh, that, to really encourage, uh, you know, people to seek help and also to uh, set in set in such structures that actually enable them to do that, not, not you know, serving it only as a paper dragon. Yeah. Well, the thing where I, I take some uh, umbrage to is this idea of it not being in the policy, because frankly, uh, it's common sense to try to support people from a humane point of view, you know, so even if my policy tells me or, or doesn't tell me what I should do, as a thinking person, uh, I realize to reach out to somebody is an important thing to do. So, uh, if if uh, people are caught behind policies um, dictating every action that they do, then you have to think twice about what your role is. Yeah, so that is that is true. So I've had uh, people reach out to me saying, "Hey, Sunil, uh, how much uh, time do we have for paternity leave?" So I was like, "I've I've never been married, so I've i I don't know how many days." <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. But then you know the answer, I I'll uh, you know give you an answer. So I asked that person. Uh, saying yeah but why why did you ask me i thought you are the hr uh, but then i was doing uh, you know technical work in the, in that organization there uh, and at so many levels uh, you get a response only from the hr only if you if you put you know two or three level as uh, mm-hmm. answer in the equation and until then you get responses mm-hmm. true to that uh, they were they were responding to uh, i think they were there were 80 people in the organization uh, that supports close to 20k 20k employees, 80k, 80 in HR. So uh, it's, it's not just the personality; it's also a system that's uh, systemically there. Mm-hmm. In terms of bandwidth, it may not be possible. If bandwidth is there, it's not in the policy. Sorry, you know, we may not mm-hmm. help for. There, there are so many things around the HR world, but I think that's a that's another time for another podcast. Mm-hmm. We we can create controversies on that. Yeah, <laughs> it's about you. So yeah, so been close to an hour to uh, you know having a conversation with you around various topics we've danced around uh, the whole garden of topics and uh, yeah maybe uh, a closing thought from your end as to what uh, has been your experience so far that 
you know you'd like to share to the other uh, others who are listening and and uh, yeah um hmm, that's an interesting question again um i would just uh i have a little poster here uh, next to my desk, and I got that when I became self-employed, and it says your only limit is your mind, and so I guess I'd like to leave that uh, with with all listeners because we all have that experience where we set limitations on ourselves for various reasons, um, and you know it's been a, a journey for myself as a self-employed person to uh, overcome some limitations I've said or I thought about, and I just, you know, have to put myself out there a little bit more uh, in this in this uh, career path I've chosen now. And so I, I look at that poster every day to remind myself that, you know, just go out there and try things and see where it takes you and be open to new experiences. So uh, I also think of that for people that I work with professionally and who I meet through these activities like yourself. So I think it's important to keep that as a mantra. <laughs> nice. So, uh, so wonderfully put uh, the, the limitation that we all also put ourselves is the, uh, the limitation is in our mind. Uh, and yeah, as a coach uh, myself, I, I do understand the self-limiting beliefs. Just want to, you know, plug it in there saying, you know, if, if you are in, uh, if you're in the European Union, uh, if you're in Switzerland, you have anything that's got to do with wellness, burnout, uh, generally coaching, uh, Barbara is the person for you and vice versa. If, you, if, 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 if you're listening in India, you can always get in touch with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, Barbara, so it's been uh, a fun one hour plus uh, listening to you and I think I can, uh, we, we can go on, we, we can have coffee chats uh, like this but it's been really interesting to listen to all of the experiences the authenticity that uh, with which you shared some of your experiences i'm sure there are more uh, maybe in the near future some sometime else uh, there there could be episode 2 i am really looking forward to that i hope that that is also interesting for you mm -hmm. so thank you so much for uh, making time and uh, being on this podcast Thanks, Sunil. You asked some really good and some challenging questions. So I appreciate that. It's been a nice discussion. Yes. Thank you, Barbara. So thanks for having me.